We welcome uh, Samantha Blizzard uh, to our uh, episode today. She's a registered dietitian for the Atlantic Superstore. Uh, and Samantha, before we get into the questions, uh, let's talk about how you uh, you got into uh, into the Atlantic Superstore uh, and what you do there. Sure thing, Mike. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so my name's Samantha. I am a registered dietitian. I work for uh, two Superstore locations located on Prince Edward Island. So I work primarily at the Charlottetown Superstore. Um, that's where my main office space is, but I also offer services in Montague, which is a smaller um, location on PEI, but by customer request um, because I do use the pharmacy consult room there. And yeah, I've been with the Superstore for about three and a half years now. And I really, really enjoy it. So I'm looking forward to having this conversation today. Excellent. Uh, so let me, let's start off uh, uh, with this one. Uh, what does it mean to be a registered dietitian and what do they do? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the number one thing that I share when it comes to registered dietitians is that there is so much misinformation out there when it comes to nutrition. And we have to be really cautious about where we're getting our nutrition information. And so what's really wonderful about seeing a registered dietitian, speaking with one or hearing from one, like, for example, on a podcast, is that we really are the number one source of evidence-based nutrition advice in Canada. And we are the only regulated nutrition professionals. And so we do have to go through um, a four-year nutrition degree as well as um, a, a year-long internship program as well afterwards. And it is important, too, that we keep up on continuing education every year as nutrition information is always changing. Um, yeah, so we really just, I mean, we do a variety of things. We work in a variety of roles. Myself, I work within the community. I primarily see people one-on-one -on -one, um, for any nutrition concern, really, that they have. It could be something as simple as seeing someone um, who's looking for more meal ideas or maybe family meal planning, for example. Maybe they live a really busy lifestyle and they're just looking to get some advice on how they can make it a bit easier to incorporate healthy meals into their day. Or maybe it could be somebody who has, you know, who is struggling with a number of health conditions and they, they're receiving a lot of different nutrition advice. And they're just looking to incorporate some of that advice into their day to day and get it, you know, in a practical way from somebody who can sit down and help them. That's primarily what I do. But there are dietitians who work more in the clinical field. So that could be like in a hospital setting. Um, and there are dietitians as well who work in that food service. So it could be um, like overseeing a kitchen or the menu in a nursing home, for example. Excellent. Uh, what, what, do you, uh, what do you love the most about what you do? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> um, I think for me in particular, I love helping people rediscover the pleasure and food again because I think in our society there's so much pressure when it comes to being in a thin body for example um, or like losing weight that a lot of the time you know the connection that food brings to us you know brings people together it's a social thing it, it is meant to be pleasurable and I think we lose that because we're so focused on all of these food roles and and you know staying being really careful about foods and potentially staying in a smaller body too. So I think what I love is I'm able to sit down with people and share that, you know, food is meant to be pleasurable. So let's find a way that we can incorporate this nutrition advice in a way that also tastes good as well. And it's going to be sustainable for you long-term. Okay. Uh, Canada somewhat recently established a new food guide, uh, which uh, I think gets established, you know, I'm not sure, every decade, every couple of decades, I'm not sure. But can you tell me about what some of the recommendations that are in this uh, new guide and, uh, and what they are and how it's different from the previous food guide? Sure, I would love to. Um, yeah, you're right. Like I said, nutrition information is always changing. And so um, Canada did come out with an, a relatively new, uh, actually it was quite different, the new Canada's food guide. 
approximately five years ago now that I think they came out with it, but a lot of people still haven't seen it before. So I do speak to it quite a bit. So you might remember the older one. There was a few versions, but the one you might remember is it was more so like there was, it looked like a rainbow. There were four different food groups. Um, and the, really the recommendations were around serving sizes of different food groups recommended per day, depending on your age, depending on your sex, for example. Um, and now they've really shifted that to visually what our plate should look like in an ideal world every day. And so just to explain that, it's a lot easier to explain it visually. I will say okay, so. Um, this is my first time explaining it just over audio. So I'll try to explain it. So ideally, when we're looking at our plate, in order to get the nutrients that our body needs to have enough energy to support our overall health, we're looking to get ideally a good source of protein with every meal, um, a good source of carbohydrates, ideally ones that are giving us a bit more fiber, like whole grain sources of carbohydrates, for example. And then a really great source of fruits or vegetables as well for additional vitamins and minerals. And so I'll give an example of what that could look like. I really like to simplify it as much as possible because we can, we can really overcomplicate nutrition, I think. So it could look like if you're having breakfast, maybe you're choosing to have oatmeal for breakfast and you're choosing a steel cut oatmeal, for example, that offers a bit more fiber. That would be your carbohydrate and your whole grain section of the plate. Then what we're missing is a protein source and a fruit or vegetable source. So what I like to do with nutrition is I like to use the add-in mentality. So let's think about how we can add protein to that bowl of oatmeal. So it could be choosing to make your oatmeal with um, milk for, your, for a protein source rather than water. Now in the old Candace Who Guide, you'll remember that milk and alternatives used to be their own food group. Now, they haven't gotten rid of that. What they've done is they've just incorporated dairy products into the protein section of the plate. So if you're choosing to have milk or fruit yogurt or cheese as part of your meal, that just counts as a protein source because we know that those foods are high in protein. So going back to the oatmeal example, maybe we add some milk for protein, and maybe we also go a little bit further and we sprinkle some hemp parts onto the oatmeal as well, which are a really great protein source. It's like a seed um, that I like to talk about often with my clients. So we could sprinkle some of that onto there to get a great source of plant-based protein as well. And then the only thing we're missing from the plate to get all those nutrients that our body needs is that fruit or vegetable. So vegetables don't often go well with oatmeal. So I'd recommend maybe choosing some fruit. So maybe you cut up some apple, maybe you have some berries on there, um, maybe it's some banana, you could even add some peanut butter to make it a bit more flavorful. And that's really an example of how we tie together what's recommended in the plate into a really simple meal. So that's one of the things that I work on with a lot of clients. Wow, that's, uh, that's great. We know that nutrition needs change as we go through different life stages. So what are some of the nutrients of concern for seniors and what are some tips to address them? But there's a few key nutrients that we want to be a little bit extra cautious of, making sure we get enough of as we age. Um, so I'm going to talk about three today, the three that stick out the most that are spoken about the most. The first one is calcium. Now you may have heard this before that as we age, particularly 50 plus, our calcium needs do rise as our risk for osteoporosis rises as well. Um, so we can get enough calcium from our food, technically. Um, you just have to be mindful, a little bit more mindful as you're aging, that you're maybe paying a bit more attention to the amount of calcium that you're incorporating into your diet. And most of you probably know, calcium primarily comes from um, dairy products. So again, going back to that yogurt, um, milk, cheese, for example. Well, we can also get good sources of calcium from uh, other foods as well. Some examples could be um, like fish, fish with bones in particular, almonds, koshu, or even 
seven dark leafy greens as well. And there's a really great website too. If you go into Google and you type in calcium calculator, you can actually go in and it'll tell you a whole bunch of foods that um, have calcium in them. And you can click off the ones that you eat the most often and it'll actually calculate in an average day how much calcium you're getting. So as a dietitian, I always suggest a food first approach before we decide whether or not we need a supplement. But the recommended amount of calcium per day for somebody over 50 is 1,200 milligrams per day. So say you try that calcium calculator out and you notice, you know, you're really not getting close to that number. Maybe it's something you want to talk about with your doctor or your pharmacist, or if you do have a dietitian, then we can have a look and see if we would, might recommend a supplement for you. So that's one of the nutrients. A second nutrient that's really important that goes along with the calcium is vitamin D. And so vitamin D is really what helps us absorb calcium. So like I said, it goes hand in hand with that risk of osteoporosis. So for people who are above 50, again, the recommendation is a little bit higher at about 800 to 2,000 international units per day. And unlike calcium, vitamin D is a challenging one to get enough of from just diet alone. As most of you probably know, you can get vitamin D from the sun, but also, as most of you know, we live in Canada and we live in the Maritime. And because of that, um, we don't get sun all year round. And so we can't rely on the sun for our vitamin D source when vitamin D is so important to our overall health. Um, so this is one that I recommend actually supplementing from birth to the very end of life. And it's because, again, it really is challenging to get enough from food. So what might that look like for supplementing? Well, a supplement generally might offer, you can get them with about 400 international units, up to about a thousand international units of vitamin D. So something along the lines of 800 to a thousand per day would be pretty supportive for overall health um, for somebody who is 50 or above. Some of the foods, though, if you were wondering where you can get vitamin D, it's mostly fortified foods. So again, it's some of those dairy products. Um, there are even some products like margarine, for example, that are fortified with vitamin D. Uh, some fish has vitamin D as well. Like I said, the list is quite small, maybe compared to the calcium sources. So that's the one we want to, you know, make sure that we probably in our supplementing. But again, you can always ask your doctor or your pharmacist, if you're feeling, um, if you'd like to be cautious. Okay, um, the third nutrient that we want to be a little bit cautious of as well as we age is actually vitamin B12. Now, this is something that so long as you're not a vegetarian or a vegan and you eat animal products on a regular basis, you're probably getting enough vitamin B12 anyway. But the reason that we want to be more mindful of it as we age is because the truth is that our stomach acid lowers a bit as we age. And so because of that, we're not able to absorb vitamin B12 as much as when we were younger. And so if you're somebody who maybe doesn't like to eat a lot of protein foods, for example, like meat or fish, or poultry, or even eggs, for example, you might want to be mindful of your vitamin B12. And that's something, again, you can look into with your doctor, or your pharmacist, or your dietitian as well. There is this really wonderful food, though, that a lot of people don't either know about or they don't know how to you, and it's called nutritional yeast. And it has a very high amount of B12 in the product. So sometimes for somebody who is vegan or vegetarian, I may suggest buying some nutritional yeast. You can purchase it in the natural section of the superstore. So the natural value section, there's a couple different brands on the shelf. And, and it's something that has kind of a naturally cheesy taste. And it's something that you can really sprinkle onto or into anything. 
So if you were making a pasta dish, for example, you could sprinkle some nutritional yeast on top of that. Um, if you were making a soup, for example, you could sprinkle some in and just mix it up. And you barely really even know it's there. Like I said, it just adds kind of a nutty, cheesy taste. Hard, that's a hard one to describe. Um, if you were, some people like to make it on popcorn. So if you make popcorn and you like to sprinkle a little flavor on there, you could sprinkle a little bit of nutritional yeast on there as well. And again, incorporating these types of food is something that a dietitian can help you with. So just revisiting the main three nutrients that we want to be mindful of as we age are calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin B12. Excellent. Well, thanks. Uh, on that theme, what vitamin mineral supplements should seniors consider taking and why? And is it different for males versus females? Yeah, so those are some other good questions. Um, so going back to the one, the supplements that seniors should consider taking, it really just depends on your individual needs. Um, I, again, would recommend that vitamin D for everybody. but when it comes to, for example, like I mentioned, calcium and vitamin B12, it really just depends on what you're getting in your diet. And so the recommendation is to, you know, do a diet, have somebody do a little dietary assessment first to see if there's something that you might be lacking. You can also get blood work as well to see if you might be lacking specific nutrients. Um, but it, I would caution anybody in just taking supplements just because. Because there are some supplements that um, if we have too much of a nutrient, it can become actually dangerous. So we want to be really mindful before we start taking anything. So one supplement, though, that I didn't mention yet, that I do end up recommending for a lot of individuals, is omega-3 fatty acids. I feel like omega-3 is one of those things that we hear about a lot lately. Um, it's quite popular in the media, and it's for good reason. Again, we always want to check in and make sure it is the right thing for you before starting anything. But the thing about omega-3 fats is that it's an essential fatty acid that our body doesn't make, which means that we have to get it from food or from in a supplement form if we want our body to be having any omega-3. And so how we get that is really there's a sh quite a short list. And the primary food that we need to eat to get a significant source of omega-3, it's fatty fish in particular. And so these types of fish would include salmon, um, trout, mackerel, herring is another one. Um, these are some of the main ones. And so if we're somebody who doesn't enjoy fish, or if we don't eat fish on a regular basis, the odds are is that we're not getting probably enough omega-3. There are other foods that do offer omega-3 that are plant sources, but again, the list is quite small. So some of those foods would include um, black seed, for example, um, chia seeds, or going back to those hemp hearts that I was talking about That's earlier, walnut specifically. And even some oil, like canola oil, for example, offers a good source of omega-3. So if we're not incorporating those foods on a regular basis, again, it could, it could be that we're not getting enough omega-3. And again, it is an essential nutrient, meaning if we don't get it in our diet, we don't have it at all. One of the major benefits that omega-3 fatty acids offers is potential benefits for cardiovascular health. And it may also play a role in reducing inflammation too. And so if you're somebody who's at risk for, for example, high cholesterol or at risk for heart disease, maybe it runs in your family, it may be something that you'd like to, you'd want to consider. As well as you, if you suffer from arthritis or just inflammation in general, it might be something that you want to consider too. So in terms of the question about well, whether or not men and women need to take different supplements or the same amount of supplements. It's kind of a challenging question because it really, again, does depend on the individual 
person. And um, again, what foods they're eating, even things like body size play a role as well when it comes to supplements. One difference that you will see between multivitamins, for example, for women and men, is that you'll notice that the, the women's multivitamins have more um, iron included in them, for example. And that's just because women generally need, need more iron because of their menstrual cycle compared to men. And so too much iron for men who don't need as much can become toxic because it's too much. So that's an example of how it might differ for men and women. Uh, there's also some other vitamins that are recommended at a higher dose for men compared to women. And again, it's because it's potentially based on body size. However, it has to be very individual to the person because we can't always assume that a man is going to need more or, or be in a larger body than a woman either. Um, so that is a very challenging question to answer. However, I would recommend um, talking to a healthcare professional if you have any other additional questions. Okay. So, Samantha, when should someone consider using a, a meal replacement uh, such as Boost or Insure? Ah, that's a good question as well. Um, again, meal replacements, a lot of these questions are, you know, on an individual basis. So, meal repla replacements are going to be recommended on an individual basis. But some of the situations where you may need one are for people who are at risk for deficiency. And that could be for a variety of reasons. But some examples could be if eating solid, solid food is a challenge for you. It could be a challenge, for example, if you're in recovery from an illness or from a surgery, for example. Or if there's any other reason why you may be struggling to get enough nutrients throughout the day. So, for example, maybe you really struggle with your appetite. Maybe because you're taking a particular medication, for example. Um, so, these are things that need to be looked at on an individual basis, but they can come in handy when we need a little boost in nutrition. Here's, here's something that uh, I think challenges everybody from uh, any age uh, and seniors, of course, is... What's a food label and why should we, we be reading them? Yeah, the, the food labels, they come up a lot in my work, particularly at the grocery store because, you know, we have all the products available there. And one thing I love about my job, I'll share too, is that actually yeah. as a grocery store dietitian, we're able to take people down onto um, the grocery store floor and we can grab a cart. And we can wrap around together and actually look at food labels together, grocery stop together. I can share products that I would recommend for you in your situation, your lifestyle. Um, and you can show me what you're buying and I can show you maybe an alternative that I may suggest for you based on, again, your like dislikes and maybe different health conditions you have going on. But I just wanted to mention that because sometimes people don't know that that's available to them and it is. Um, super store location. So what is a food label? Really, a food label just breaks down the nutrients in a particular product. And so they can be a really challenging thing to know how to read. And it can be also very overwhelming to know what to pay attention to on a nutrition level, let on a, on a nutrition label. Um, the first thing that we would look at on a nutrition label is actually the serving size. So most people, when I ask them that question, what's the first thing you would look for on a nutrition label? They would say like sugar, for example, or they may say the fat, or they may even say the calories. But really, the serving size is the most important thing to look at because all of the numbers that are on a nutrition label are representative of an amount of food. And so if you're consuming, say, two, two times the serving size, then those numbers of nutrients aren't going to be representative of what you're eating. And so the serving size is the first thing that we're always going to look at. For a senior population, one of the major things that I would encourage everybody to look at is the fiber content of a product. One of the little tricks that I like to share with all people 
that I see, no matter if it's the senior population or the younger population, when we're looking at a label, one of the tricks we can use, it's using the percent daily value. So if you look on the label and you look at the right side of the label, you'll notice that there's percentages of pretty much every nutrient. So a really easy way to compare products is to is say you're comparing two boxes of crackers, for example, and you're looking for one that has more fiber. A really easy way to do that is to look at the percentage of fiber. So there will be a percentage directly beside on the right side of the word fiber. And what that's really saying, and a great way to break it down, is that 5% or less of any nutrient is considered a little. And 15% or more of any nutrient would be considered a lot. So if we're thinking about fiber, for most people, that's something we want more of in our diet. Most of us are not getting enough fiber. Fiber is wonderful for so many things, particularly as we're aging. One of the things that probably the first thing that you think of is digestion. And so making sure everything is moving. And um, I know as we get older, sometimes that can be a major challenge, keeping things moving in our digestive tract. So getting, you know, additional fiber is going to be really important for that. Something else that fiber helps with is actually lowering our cholesterol. And so that's another reason that we want to pay attention to fiber on the label. Another thing that fiber can help with is leveling out our blood sugars. So if we're struggling with pre-diabetes, or maybe we are diabetic, one of the major things that we're going to want to be mindful of on a nutrition label is fiber. And finally, fiber helps to keep us full for longer. So if we're struggling, maybe we're finding we're hungry all day, you know, or feeling very snackish all the time, we find we just can't get enough to eat. It may be that you need a bit more fiber in your diet as well. So, um, if going back to the percent daily value, if we're looking to get more fiber in our diet, what we would look for is, does this product have more or less than 15% daily value of fiber per serving? And again, going back to the two boxes of crackers, maybe one box of crackers has 5% fiber per serving. And maybe the serving size of eight crackers. Maybe the other box has a serving size of nine crackers and the fiber is 13%, let's say. So if you're looking for a product with more fiber, then we would choose that, that one with 13% that also offers you more crackers as well. This is something, again, that's a lot more, <laughs> a lot easier when we have a visual in front of us. And again, that's where a dietitian in the superstore can help you to actually go around and look at label. Um, but hopefully that explains that well. Another nutrient that we might want to be mindful of as we age is sodium. Not necessarily for a recommendation for everybody, but if we're struggling with um, high blood pressure, for example, or risk of heart disease at all, um, it's, it might be something that we do want to be mindful of. This is an example of something we can, again, use the 5 and 15% rule for, but we're looking to get less of this nutrient this time. So say we're comparing two different cans of soup, for example. Maybe one can of soup or a cup and a half of soup is, let's say, 15% sodium. And another can of soup is 25% sodium for a cup and a half. You'll see that a lot in, in products like canned soup or sauces, that the sodium is going to be much, much higher um, compared to maybe something like a cracker. And so with that, you kind of just have to choose your battle. <laughs> a lot of the time, it's not going to be less than 15%. But again, you can use that rule to compare and say, you know, I'm looking, if I really want to enjoy this canned soup, something that I like, I want to incorporate it into my day, but I am trying to be mindful of sodium. Maybe we choose the one that has 15% sodium 
instead of the one that has 25% sodium. So, Matthew, what are some tips for eating healthy on a budget? Ooh, that's a great question, particularly for those who are in the aging population because, you know, it's important for us to be budgeting and particularly with the food prices rising so much these days. No matter what age you are, we're all trying to save a dollar when it comes to our food. So this is something that I really enjoy talking about. I have a lot of tips for this. And going back to working one-on-one, this is where a dietitian could work one-on-one with you to sit down, even look at your budget and help you with things like meal planning, for example. Meal planning is very individualized, so it is a very challenging thing to explain because there is no one size fits all. But basically with meal planning, the goal is to have a set plan going into the week. So that you utilize all the food that you buy and you have a plan for the food that you buy. Instead of just buying random foods or the same list that you buy every week and some things going to waste. I think we've all been in the position where maybe we're trying to eat a bit healthier, trying to get more nutrients in. And maybe we buy a bunch of fresh fruits and vegetables with the best intention and half of it goes to waste, for example. (laughs) So with that, Really what the planning does is, again, it gives us an idea of what types of meals we're going into the week having, and it ensures that we're only buying the ingredients that we really need, as well as we have to think about things like snacks and breakfast, for example, too. So we'll buy what we need for the week, and we'll plan to actually eat the doll instead of just, again, going to the grocery store with no plan and buying random food. And lots of it going to waste. So that's one of my biggest tips is working with a dietitian or, you know, doing your own research to try to find, you know, tips for meal planning so that we are minimizing waste. Another huge tip that I have when it comes to eating well on a budget is utilizing more plant sources of protein more often. So I think we can all agree that most of the time, the most expensive thing on our grocery list is often the meat. So it could be chicken, it could be beef, it could be, you know, pork, it could be a roast. Those are the things that cost a lot of money. So if there is a way that we can incorporate more plant sources of protein instead, we're going to save a lot of money. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I think a lot of people, when they hear the term plant-based protein, they think of some of the new, um, like, imitation meat plant burgers, for example. And that's really not what we're talking about here, because even those products can be quite expensive. What we're talking about is the whole food version of um, plant based protein. So plant sources that also offer us protein naturally. So I'm going to give you a few examples. One example would be using things like beans and legumes more often. So it could be like black beans, lentils, chickpeas, for example. When we're buying things like those, we primarily buy them in a can or dry, and it might cost about a dollar fifty. So a dollar fifty compared to what you might spend on chicken these days, for example, right? Maybe $20 or something compared to $1.50. It's a huge saving. As long as we can find a way that we can use that in a way that we enjoy. And I think that's the challenge when it comes to even where we live, is that what's normalized for supper meals, lunch meals, for example, is really like meat and potato style meal. And so we're just used to buying meat and we're used to cooking with meat. And so because of that, it's a challenge for someone to say, you know, oh, you know, just buy more chickpeas and and utilize those as your diet. Well, how do I do that is always the question. And so again, this is where you working with a dietitian, she can really, they can really show you how you can include Incorporate these foods into your diet in a way that's not too different and in a way that tastes good as well. 
Some other examples of plant-based protein would be tofu, for example, or even that seeds. So things like pumpkin seeds or um, almonds, for example. Tofu is another one where, again, we don't have a lot of experience, most of us, cooking with tofu. And so we kind of just disregard it, even though it costs about again, $2.99 probably for a big block of tofu compared to maybe, you know, if you were choosing hamburger, which might cost us about $15 for a big pack. So I'm going to give you some examples of ways that you could utilize some of these foods. Keeping in mind, again, that you may want to get some extra guidance or some recipes from somebody who has a bit of experience like a dietitian. So an example could be lentils. Lentils are ones that I like to start with, with people because they're really easy to utilize in any meal that calls for ground meat. So one example I like to give often is spaghetti. I think in the maritime, most of us like to enjoy spaghetti on a regular basis. It's easy, it's cost effective for the most part, but most of us still are putting ground beef with our spaghetti because that's what we're used to. And ground beef keeps just going up and up in price. And so one of the things that we can do is we can buy a can of lentils, which again, costs you about maybe $1.29 to $1.50. And we can just drain those lentils out rinse the mass really well and they have a similar color and texture actually as ground meat so they're brown in color most of them and the texture is like i said it, they're quite small and round and so when they're lumped in with spaghetti for example and a saw they do have a similar texture to ground meat does it have the exact same taste no it's not going to have the exact same taste as um, ground beef does of course I find lentils have a natural peppery taste to them, and so they do taste quite nice. But if you don't want to lose that ground beef taste, one tip I have for you is actually to, to incorporate half beef as your protein, cut back on the amount that you would use, and then bump up the protein by using a can of lentils as well. That way you're still getting the flavor from the beef, but you're cutting back on the amount of beef that you're eating saving you some money. So you would make the spaghetti the same. Maybe going back to that healthy plate model, right? That Canada food guide we were talking about earlier. Maybe you would choose a whole grain pasta with a bit more fiber and going back to fiber. <laughs> and we would incorporate maybe it could be just as simple as a jarred tomato sauce. Using the lentil as your protein, maybe a little bit of beef in there for flavor. And then I would, going back to the budget-friendly eating, I would probably gravitate more towards choosing some frozen vegetables. There is a mix of frozen diced vegetables. I think they call it spaghetti mix, which is perfect for this meal. And it has, I believe, red peppers, onion, think carrots and celery. And it's already chopped for you really, really fine. And so it's very simple to just throw into a sauce and heat up. And there you go. You have a balanced meal. You have your vegetables. You have your protein that's more fast effective. You have your whole grain. And it's delicious too. You can even add a bit of cheese on there for some extra calcium and vitamin D. So that's a tip I have is learning how to utilize those plant sources of protein can save us a lot of money. Finally, going back to the frozen fruits and veggies. So I did just mention utilizing frozen vegetables, but I want to expand on that because I think people don't recognize, first of all, just as nutritious as fresh. So it really doesn't matter if you're using frozen fruit or vegetable or fresh fruit or vegetable. They truly are equally nutritious. And so... What I like about them is you can take out what you need from the freezer, use them in your meal, and then put them back in the freezer so nothing's going to waste. Whereas if you're utilizing fresh fruits and vegetables, you really have to be mindful about using them up in time. So the frozen fruits and vegetables, 
they're going to last you longer and they're going to save you money because you can even get them on sale. Oftentimes it's two for something or they'll go on a big sale just individually as well. And they're not going to go bad. You should check out the fruits and vegetables se- section too, the frozen section, because if you haven't checked it out in a while, they are really, really expanding the variety compared to what they used to have. And so you'll see different fruits and veggies that maybe you won't even find in the fresh, fresh produce section that are located in the, in the frozen section. An example is I love one of my favorite shirt frozen fruit mixtures is a mixture of dragon fruit, passion fruit, and pineapple. It's a tropical mixture that is available um, at Superstore. It's PC brand. And I will often buy this frozen fruit blend when it's on sale. And I'll use it. I'll put it into things like smoothies or I'll put it in a yogurt bowl. And what I like about it is that I don't have to do any of the preparation or find passion fruit and dragon fruit on the shelf. All the preparation's done for me and all I have to do is thaw it out. So using these from some fruits and vegetables is a great way to save money too. So can you give us one or two examples of simple recipes that can be made uh, for one or two people? Absolutely. But I think it's really interesting because myself, oh, I don't have a family at this time. It's just myself and my fiance. And so we cook for just the two of us. And so I ha- actually have a lot of experience cooking for one or two. And I find it so interesting how generally when we have a, when most of us will go and have a family, we get used to cooking these really large meals because that's what you need at the time. And then when you become a senior and maybe your family's not in the home anymore and you're really just feeding yourself or yourself and your partner, it's really challenging, I think, for many people to go back to buying for just one or two people and cooking for one or two people for one or two people. And I think we forget how to do that. And so what I'm here to say today is that it doesn't show to be complicated. And I think that we often, again, overcomplicate our meal, um, particularly when we're trying to eat nutritious meals. So I'm going to give you some examples of meals that you can throw together easily that would make about enough for one or two, maybe with a little bit of leftovers as well. All of these meals, too, you'll, not- you'll notice will follow that canned food guide. So we'll have that whole grain source, we'll have a protein source, and we'll have a fruit or vegetable as well. So one example, it could be as simple as making tuna milk for supper or for lunch. So you could get a whole grain bread that you love, get that fiber in there. Put mix some tuna with some mayo or any spices that you like. You, you could even mix it with avocado as well, bump up your fruit consumption. You could put that on your whole grain toast and melt some cheese on top, put it in the oven, and pair it with some sort of a, like a cherry tomato or maybe some cut up apple, and that's your meal. And that might sound like maybe more of a lunch meal, but you could certainly have that for supper too. You could just make enough for yourself and for somebody else. You could even make a little a little bit leftover if you'd like, or some leftover tuna mixture to have the next day. Another example could be making something like a barbecue chicken flatbread stuff. So there's a lot of different options out there now for multi-grain flatbread, and that's going to give us a bit of fiber as well. It's kind of like a pizza dough, um, but everything's already made for you, and again, it's got a bit more fiber to it. And so if you picked up a multigrain flatbread that would be your source of carbohydrate you could put something like a barbecue sauce on there you could throw maybe or some rotisserie chicken on there or buy a two pack of chicken and just use you know, maybe one breath and you could throw some of your favorite vegetables on there too so it could be like mm, red pepper maybe green pepper I normally use mixed bell peppers and some red onion. So we're getting that vegetable component. Top it with some cheese, throw it in the oven, and you have enough for that night. And then maybe a bit lunch the next. Another example could be maybe like a big taco salad, for example. But instead of using ground beef, we use some black beans. 
just rinsed and drained and we're saving again going back to saving some money so this we could we can make our black beans put them in a pan with a bit of oil and some taco seasoning mix our vegetables into a bowl for taco salad i like to use things like peppers and onions and i like to use um tomato lettuce cheese some crushed up corn chips or even doritos you can have fun with that and make yourself some sort of a, a taco dressing put those black beans in there for the protein and call it a meal finally another example that i like to do often is wrapped wraps can be really simple you can just throw in some sort of protein so you could do like a meat protein like again going back to that rotisserie chicken you could even do a steak wrap you can throw whatever veggies that you have in there sauce that you enjoy maybe some cheese and that in itself can be a balanced meal if you wanted to do a plant-based version too there are a lot of recipes out there for um like chickpea salad so instead of a chicken salad you could do a chickpea salad and so you kind of mash up you drain and rinse a can of chickpeas mash them up you can put herbs and spices in there some mayo and just actually put it on something like a wrap or a toasted sandwich i like to put something like avocado in there for a bit of creaminess um and yeah i might serve it with like some apple slices or something and call it a meal so as you can see, these meals are really, they're not complicated, but they have those components that we're looking for in a balanced meal and they give us the nutrients that our body needs and the energy that we need as well. What are some meal preparation ideas that are suitable for freezing, especially if you want to just be able to freeze uh, a meal for one or two? Yeah. So all of those other you know, ideas that I just talked about. They're great for in the moment, but not as much for freezing. And that's a really good question. So I think when you're cooking for one or two, you really have to make the freezer your best friend. <laughs> Especially if you're used to making big meals and you still enjoy some of those big meals or recipes. So that could be maybe you have like soup and stew recipes that you love to use in the fall and winter and you don't want to give those up. Just making sure you have some great containers around that you can throw in that you can put some in the freezer portion it out and utilize that um, for a quick meal at a later date some examples of meals that would work really well that you could make a big batch of would be maybe something like a lasagna soup and i'm going to incorporate all the tips that we talked about so far so let's talk about canis food guide again let's talk about budget friendly Something like a lasagna soup, it could, we could do like a whole grain lasagna noodle, follow the recipe, but instead of using the ground meat, again, we can use those lentils in that and just bump it up with some spinach. Maybe you like to buy the big fresh containers of spinach, you can even buy spinach from frozen. And that goes really nicely with something like lasagna or a lasagna soup. And that would bump up the vegetables and the nutrient content of the meal. And so make a big batch of that, freeze some of it, it'll freeze really nicely for you and it'll be perfect to take out of the freezer for a quick meal at a later date. Another example that I like to talk about often is shepherd's pie. A shepherd's pie is another one of those classic meat and potato style meals, but it's one of those ones that we can do the lentils again. <laughs> I told you I talk, like to talk about lentils a lot. So if we did um, even have beef and lentils, utilize a mixed frozen vegetable for the middle of the shepherd's pie, and then we topped it off with some potato on top, that's going to give us our carbohydrate that we need, our protein, and it's giving us our vegetables too. So it's a balanced meal, and we can make a really big batch of that. And again, if it's something we feel we're not going to get get through no worry as long as we have great containers airtight containers that we can utilize for the freezer just cut it up put it into the freezer and then you can take individualized portions out for the future for an easy meal finally another example that i have that freezers really well 
is something like a sweet and sour stir fry made with pineapple to make it a little bit more fun. And actually, one thing we can utilize to make it budget friendly is instead of using chicken, which I think is kind of the classic protein that we tend to use in stir fry, we could use something like edamame bean. And so if you never heard of an edamame bean, generally we find them in the frozen section of the grocery store. Sometimes you can find them fresh, but they are challenging to find fresh. But what they are is they're actually an immature soybean. They're green in color and they have a bit of a crunch to them compared to like a black bean or a chickpea or a lentil that's a bit softer in texture. So they're really nice for stir fries where we like a little bit more of a crisp texture. The one thing you could do is you could make up some rice, which freezes really well. Get a frozen bag of uh, mixed stir fry vegetables, a frozen bag of edamame beans, a bottled sauce. This is where you can utilize the labels. If you're looking for minimizing sodium, you can compare a couple and choose one that's a bit lower in sodium. Add it all into the frying pan. Maybe, like I said, to first it up, you could add a bit of canned pineapple too for a bit of flavor. Mix it all up and eat, have some for supper. And then any leftovers, that will freeze really well. Freeze it into individual portions and take it out um, for a meal at a later date. Well, thank you. This has been a really great uh, discussion. You've given us a lot of great information. Is there anything that you can think to add that we haven't covered? Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think like, the final message that I want to leave everybody with is going back to what I said in the beginning of the podcast, why I really love the job. I want to remind everybody that there is a lot of pressure out there to be dieting and to be focused on our weight and our size. But I think it's so important that we remember that it is normal for our bodies to come in all different shapes and sizes. And there is no perfect standard size that we all should be aiming for. Everybody's healthy looks different. And I think it's important that we remember that. And so as long as we're making an effort to nourish our body in a way that feels good and tastes good, as long as we're getting out and moving, you know, in a way that we feel is sustainable and enjoyable, if we're making an effort to manage things like stress level and to get our sleep and to form social connections and relationships that are supportive to us, these are the things that make up a healthy individual. It's not just eating a certain way or just eating and exercising. There's so much that goes into making somebody, you know, healthy or unhealthy. So please remember that. And please remember that healthy looks different on everybody. And remember, food is meant to be pleasurable. That's really important. Excellent. Well, thank you. So today we've been speaking with Samantha Blizzard, who is a registered dietitian for Atlantic Superstore. And again, uh, uh, thank you, Samantha, for such uh, wonderful information. And I know that uh, all of uh, all of us uh, seniors will be uh, uh, thinking hard when we go to the grocery store. And of course, uh, if we need to, we can um, uh, reach out to a, a, a dietitian like yourself or yourself, and uh, you know, get some more guidance. So, thank you very much for helping us today. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.